Any kid who had a Famicom or Nintendo Entertainment System has at least a couple of those classic game tunes forever seared into their memory. These early 8-bit consoles could produce some really cool music. But how did it work? Well, if you've ever wondered this, then stay tuned, because today we're going to dive into the wonderful world of Famicom and NES audio. This is episode 6 in my series called Inside the Famicom. In an earlier episode, I talked about Nintendo's 2A03 and its European variant, the 2A07. These processors were designed and manufactured by the Ricoh company in Japan back in 1983. Even though it's a single physical chip, there are actually two separate chips on the die inside this package. One of them is a modified version of the famed 6502 CPU. I covered this in depth in episode 2 of this series, so go check out that video if you want to know more. But the other chip? Well, that's what Nintendo calls the APU, or Audio Processing Unit. This is the part of the Ricoh processor that produces the sound that you hear coming out of the console. For most games, everything from music, to sound effects, is produced by this chip. Nintendo combined together five distinct audio channels to get their sound. Two of the channels produce square waves, which are sometimes called pulse waves, because they pulse a digital signal straight up to a logic high, and then back down again. These pulse channels are typically used to play the melody of a song. And by combining both pulse channels together, they can be harmonized and have a neat polyphonic effect. Alongside of the pulse channels, there's also a triangle wave channel. Rather than going straight up to a digital high, this wave steps up to a peak and then back down again, forming what looks like a triangle. This channel has a deeper and smoother tone than the pulse channels, making it great for playing the bass line of a tune. The fourth channel is called the noise channel because it produces noise. This noise is seemingly random, but as we'll see in a later episode, there's actually a predictable algorithm that's driving it. And the last channel is the delta modulation channel, otherwise known as the DMC. Delta modulation is a technique that's used to digitize an analog sample, and as a result, it can play recorded audio. Now, the real magic occurs when a game uses multiple channels to produce the in-game music. By combining the square waves, the triangle wave, the noise, and digital samples, you more or less get an entire band with a lead melody, bass, and percussion. I'm going to go into each of these waveforms in more detail in episode 7 of this series. But for now, I want to leave you with this high-level overview so we can start exploring some of the other aspects of the audio circuitry. The audio processor carves out a meager two pins for all these audio channels. Pin 1 outputs a combination of both pulse channels, and pin 2 outputs the triangle, noise, and DMC channels all together. The output from these pins are then mixed and filtered differently depending on whether you're on a Famicom or an NES. If you're playing a Famicom, each output line is first passively mixed together by using a 20 kilo ohm resistor on the pulse channels and a 12 kilo ohm resistor on the triangle, noise, and DMC channels. You'll also notice there's another 10 kilo ohm mixing resistor labeled R3 in this schematic. When you follow the signal, you'll see that it leads to the microphone that's in the Famicom's Player 2 gamepad. The audio from the mic is sent into the CPU, but it's also branched off and mixed in with the audio output signal, so you can hear yourself through the TV along with the other audio from the game. 
After adding the microphone, the audio is then passed through a one microfarad capacitor before entering an inverter. This 100 kilo ohm resistor is a feedback resistor, and this causes the inverter to act as an amplifier instead of simply inverting the signal. After amplification, we see the output signal get some filtering from a 100 nanofarad capacitor, while the audio branches off into two different directions. First, it breaks off to pin two of the Famicom's expansion port, and it also continues on into the game cartridge on pin 45. This gives the cartridge an opportunity to do some additional audio processing, which we'll talk about more in just a moment. After the cartridge is done with the audio signal, it passes it back into the Famicom on pin 46. And you'll see from there, the audio gets sent into the RF modulator for modulation and output to the TV. Now, because the audio coming back into the Famicom from the cartridge doesn't get mixed in with the expansion port, that means any audio coming from the expansion port won't include the cartridge audio. I should also mention that this process is slightly different if you're looking at an AV version of the Famicom. In that model, Nintendo combined the hex inverter and the address decoders into a single chip called the JIO. I don't have a schematic for it, but the audio signal enters into pin 16 on the JIO chip for amplification and exits from pin 17 before making its way into pin 45 of the cartridge. Okay, so I mentioned a couple minutes ago that the cartridge has the ability to perform some additional audio processing, but this wasn't very common. The Famicom had over 1,000 licensed cartridge-based games released in its lifetime, and out of those, only about three dozen used that cartridge audio capability. So 97% of the Famicom games on the market would just bridge pins 45 and 46 and pass the audio right through the cartridge and back into the system. But those three dozen or so games that did use it included custom chips that could augment the Famicom's audio features. Most of the time, these chips weren't specifically dedicated to audio. They were primarily mapper chips, which sometimes included additional audio capabilities. Now, mappers are used to expand the memory capacity inside a cartridge. This lets you have ROM chips that are larger than the available address space. We'll talk more about mapper chips when we dive deeper into game cartridges in a future episode. These audio enhancements would normally take the form of additional audio channels. Sunsoft, for example, had a chip called the Sunsoft 5B. The audio in this chip was based on the Yamaha YM2149F and that added three additional audio channels. All of them were square wave channels with an envelope generator and a noise generator shared among them. The 5B was used in only four games that I know of, and out of those four, only one of them used the audio capabilities of the chip. The others just used it as a mapper. That game was Gimmick, and if you want a copy, be prepared to shell out some serious bucks for it. Konami, on the other hand, had the VRC6 and VRC7. The VRC6 also added three additional sound channels. Unlike the Sunsoft 5B though, only two of them were pulse channels. And although they didn't have all the features of the Famicom's built-in pulse channels, they did offer more duty cycle variations. But the VRC6's third channel offered something that the APU didn't have and that was a sawtooth waveform. Still, only three games used the VRC6. Esper Dream 2 here was one of them. But one of the best ways to demonstrate the difference in audio is in the game Castlevania 3. The Famicom version had the VRC6, while the NES version didn't.
and even more impressive was Konami's VRC7. This chip was based on the Yamaha YM2413, and it offered six channels of FM synthesis. Sadly, the VRC7 was only used in two games, and only one of them, LaGrange Point, leveraged its FM synthesis capabilities. There were other companies that also had audio enhancement chips, including Nintendo themselves. Their MMC5 mapper chip offered three additional audio channels. Then later with the release of the Famicom Disk System, Nintendo included expansion audio inside the RAM adapter. This was through the Rico RP2C33, and it was quite heavily used. Dozens of Famicom Disk games used it for wavetable audio. Now again, this was all for the Famicom. The Nintendo Entertainment System, on the other hand, was not blessed with this capability. In fact, if you owned an NES, the way your audio would be handled is somewhat different. Both audio pins on the CPU are still passively mixed with different resistor values. Unlike the Famicom, there's no microphone on the NES. However, there is another audio signal that gets mixed in. And that's external audio from pin 3 of the expansion port underneath. I don't know why the schematic says pin 6 and 7 here. I think this is a mistake because that should actually be pin 4 and pin 3. After all this mixing, the audio path is taken through a 1 microfarad cap and the inverter amplifier just like on the Famicom. However, you'll notice that the feedback resistor is a smaller value and there's some additional filtering being done here as well. After amplification, the audio output is branched off to pin 22 of the expansion port, and it also goes through an LC filter before the next leg of its journey. From there, the signal goes through a transistor amp and some additional filters before making its way out to the RCA audio port. And since the NES has both RCA and RF output, we see it going through a modulation circuit so it can be put out through the RF port as well. Aside from the additional filtering complexity, you'll notice that one of the main differences in the NES and Famicom audio designs is that the NES is missing one of the coolest capabilities, and that's cartridge audio. Now, Famicom cartridges still work in an NES if you use a cartridge adapter, but if you play a Famicom game that has an audio enhancement chip, you won't hear any of that audio. Fortunately though, there's a simple mod you can perform on that unused NES expansion port. It turns out that 10 of the pins from a 72-pin NES cartridge connect directly to it. So all you need to do is connect one of those pins from the cartridge to the expansion port's audio input pin. And when you do that, the cartridge audio is routed and mixed back into the NES audio signal. To perform this mod, you just need to solder a 47 kilo ohm resistor between pins 3 and 9 on the expansion port. That's all you need to mix the signal, so you could stop there. But folks in the community have also recommended pulling pin 9 down to ground as well in order to reduce noise. So you can also add a 1 kilo ohm resistor between pin 2 and pin 9 to do that if you'd like. You'll also need to make sure your adapter routes pin 46 from the Famicom cartridge to pin 54 on the NES cartridge connector. Most adapters don't route the Famicom audio, so if you use something like this full-sized adapter from My Arcade, you'll need to modify it to pass the audio signal through the NES cartridge pins. Keep in mind though that the cartridges with the extra audio chips tend to be bigger than the standard Famicom games so you'll have to remove the adapter from its shell in order to use it with the larger Famicom cartridges. And then you have to deal with the problem of getting it to fit inside the NES, unless of course you have a top loader. Because of that, a good alternative to the cartridge adapter is to use a ROM cart like the EverDrive N8 Pro. The EverDrive routes the audio signal from the Famicom games to pin 54, so if you've done the mod, then you'll be able to hear the Famicom audio.
The trade-off to this, of course, is that it's not using the original audio enhancement chips. Instead, the EverDrive is using its internal Cyclone 2 FPGA to produce a hardware-emulated version. Now, if you don't want to mod your NES, you can achieve the same result with an expansion slot module like this one. This is the NES Hub by RetroTime. This module is primarily focused on giving your NES additional controller support, but there are also three dip switches that'll connect the expansion port's audio signal to one of the expansion pins on the cartridge. At the time I'm recording this, the NES Hub is available for pre-order, but isn't yet shipping. In fact, this one isn't even mine. This belongs to Tito over at Macho Nacho Productions. Tito made a great video about the NES Hub, so definitely go check out his coverage on this if you haven't already seen it. And thanks Tito for lending me your board for this video. Another really interesting option is an open source project called the Expansion Port Sound Module, or EPSM. While the EPSM does bridge the audio cartridge line, it actually has a much more impressive trick up its sleeve. There's a Yamaha YMF288 on board, and this adds several new audio channels, including three additional pulse channels, six channels of four operator FM synthesis, and a six instrument drum kit. You can't really think of the EPSM as a simple audio forwarding mod. Rather, it's like taking the audio expansion chip out of the cartridge and putting it inside the NES. Now, simply having the EPSM plugged into your NES doesn't do anything other than reroute audio. So if you want to take advantage of the YMF-288, you need a game that was specifically written to interact with the EPSM. At this time, there aren't really any games that do that, though there is a Darkwing Duck ROM hack in progress that's adding EPSM support. Overall, the Famicom had some decent audio capabilities for the time period. And even though the NES didn't get all the same features, there were still some great tracks based on the five channels that it did have. I want to give a special thanks to my friend Matt Hewson, who provided me with footage and some great information on the EPSM. You may recognize Matt's name from the Nintendo Homebrew community, where he's released some excellent titles such as Witch and Wiz and From Below. Matt has a new game releasing soon called Super Sunny World, and it looks really cool. Check out Matt's YouTube channel in the description below, and be sure to pick up a copy of Super Sunny World when it's released. But for now, that brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos. All right, I'll see you next time. But as always, until then, go make something cool. <laughs>